today with Professor Michael Cronin, who is in Lisbon to take part in the seventh uh, Lisbon Summer School uh, for the Study of Culture. Um, professor Cronin is professor at Dublin City University, Ireland, and he is one of the leading voices in translation studies. He has public, published extensively on translation and mobility, translation and migration, tourism, new forms of cosmopolitanism, globalization, and he has just published a new book on eco-translation, um, which explores the relationship between translation and ecology. Would you like to tell us something about it, about this new book? Yes, I suppose um, one of the things that I did in my previous books, in my very first book, Translating Ireland, I looked at the relationship between translation and the nation. Um, in a book that I published on, in 2003, I looked at how translation is an essential part of the globalization process, that when you have the globalization of industries, the globalization of, of services, you've got the movement of people and ideas and, and things, that the thing that makes that happen is uh, translation. Uh, and then I began to think not so much about the nation or about the globe as about the earth itself. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that we are entering a new period, which is called the Anthropocene. So this is a period where, um, a new geological period, where, which is determined by the cumulative effect of human activities. In other words, that the, uh, the things that human beings are engaged in are, are changing all life forms on, on Earth. And I, was, I began to think to myself then, uh, what are the consequences uh, of that for the way in which we think about translation? Or maybe to put it differently, mm -hmm. does translation help us to think about ecological questions? And it seems to me that it does in a very, very fundamental way. Uh, what the ecological crisis, climate change, uh, global warming, is fundamentally to do with how we relate to other species, how we relate to other life forms, how we relate to uh, all the things that make up our environment, all the things that make up our, our Earth. But we are related to things that are different. Animals are different from us. Um, rivers, forests, trees, these things are, are, are different. So how do we communicate across difference? And it seems to me fundamentally, when we think about communicating across difference, what we're basically talking about is translation. We're talking about how do I translate something that is very, very different from me into a language that I can understand? And how can I communicate with all the other things that are part of my environment? Um, so it seems to me then that translation is very much uh, a discipline of this century. Climate change is the biggest challenge that we're facing this century. Uh, and translation is a way of thinking about uh, how we uh, relate uh, through, uh, through difference. It's, a very, it's an essential discipline for our, our century. And just as translation was something that accompanied uh, the Enlightenment, uh, translation was at the heart of the Reformation, translation was the heart of the arrival of major world religions in, 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 in Asia. Uh, translation was at the heart of the Industrial Revolution in bringing goods and services to different parts of, of the world. It seems to me in the 21st century that the discipline of translation is at the heart uh, of uh, new ways of thinking about and relating to the only home that we have, which is planet Earth. Uh, given that this year's topic of the Lisbon Summer School is global translation, uh, the first question I would like to ask you deals with the role of positionality of the researcher um, in a globalized uh, era and how this standpoint is sometimes felt by younger researchers as a pitfall. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yes, I, I remember writing um, an essay a number of years ago um, which was to do with translation pedagogy. And I said, that one of the problems about, for example, a lot of methods that were used to teach translation is that they assumed um, that students were the same the world over, that they had the same living conditions, they had the same uh, income, they had the same access to digital resources, to, to learning resources, um, that the market, the translation market, was the same uh, in every single country. Uh, and of course, that's not true at all. Um, when you look at the world, um, people have, depending on where you are in the world, 
you have very, very different access to digital resources, to learning resources, uh, to um, all the things that make a translation uh, possible. Um, so in other words, when we think about uh, translation, we have to think about differentiated histories, not homogenizing global histories of, of translation. So in other words, the kind of the locale, uh, the place, the context uh, of translation is uh, all important. Um, and uh, one of the things that one has to be very conscious of, I think, you know, as, as someone who is thinking about translation in, in the West, is to what extent you, you take things for granted. Uh, you take the notion of a text for granted. You take the notion of what it is to be an individual subject for granted. You make assumptions about religious and cultural traditions that are very, very different in other parts of the, of the world. And indeed, I think even within the, uh, the West itself, um, if you are Irish or Portuguese, um, your experience of global uh, politics will be def very different from if you were German or French or, or British. Um, that I think one of the things that interests me about countries like Canada, Wales, Ireland, Portugal, is we often find ourselves as neighbors to very large uh, countries beside us, countries. Yeah, but, you know, quite powerful countries. So we find ourselves in, in somewhat more marginal or peripheral positions. So what is the implications of that for translation? Um, is there a sense in which countries like ours, we have to think more consciously about translation because we're constantly exposed to models that are coming from these very large and very powerful uh, countries mm -hmm. which we have to negotiate or, or deal with in, in, in particular uh, ways. So the notion of positionalities is absolutely central uh, to what we do as, as, as translators and as translation scholars. Uh, just yesterday, Professor Sandra Berman spoke in her lecture about a translation turn in literary studies and in comparative studies at large. Uh, this turn is, of course, related to the serious humanitarian uh, challenges um, uh, we are currently dealing with. Uh, do you consider um, we may be on the verge of a larger translation turn within the human sciences? And especially, would this turn risk the collapse of translation studies as a discipline? No, I mean, I think uh, I always feel that the more uh, other areas get interested in translation, uh, the better it is for translation studies. I, I always think that it's not a case of you know, either translation studies or comparative literature, you know, either uh, globalization studies, mm -hmm. or it's, it's, it's a both and, not an either or. So uh, I think that the more inclusive uh, translation can become, the better it is for um, translation. It seems to me that the translation turn is happening in, in, in two ways. One is that uh, if you look at the, what is the big challenge now in terms of the way in which information is flowing across the, the world is that you know, there's about 3 billion people have access to the, the internet and 6 billion people have uh, mobile phones. Um, so uh, 85 out of every 100 people on, the, on planet Earth have a mobile phone. So, so people are getting access to, to information, but the difficulty is what kinds of information are they getting access to? Are they only getting access to information from their own culture, in their own language? What about all that information, all that knowledge, all those cultures that are out there in, in, in other languages? Um, unless we have a translation turn, um, the information revolution will produce a narrowing of people's horizons, not a broadening mm -hmm. of, of their horizons. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, um, one of the, and this is to go back to the notion of, of climate change and eco-translation, is this huge, huge challenge that we face, um, which unless we deal with it properly, will mean the destruction of our species. Um, the only way in which we can deal with it is to use all of our sciences, all the physical sciences and the natural sciences to develop uh, appropriate uh, responses in the scientific area to the challenge of climate change, but also we need the human and social sciences um, in order to be able to change people's behaviors, how to adapt to a different lifestyle, a different way of being, a different way of living, in order to produce a sustainable or resilient uh, culture. But you can only do that if we can translate these different disciplines mm -hmm. into a, a language that is intelligible to, to the, the different disciplines. So in that respect, I think um, that the translation turn uh, is at the heart of what I would call the new 
post-human convergence in human knowledge and the, the organization of human knowledge. Uh, for the past week in this summer school, we have been thoroughly discussing timely questions on migration, globalization, namely in relation to fear. If translation practices produce images of the others, to what extent do you think translation and non-translation practices may have contributed to the rise and spreading of fear in present societies? I think it, it has in the sense that um, what I would call intralingual translation. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, one of the things that's very striking uh, about uh, the, the rise of uh, xenophobic populism, the United States, uh, in, in, in Europe, is the way in which uh, populist movements have been able to translate uh, their prejudices um, and their fears into a language that people seem to be able to understand. Um, in other words, um, they are able to mobilize a, a, a notion of, of fear, uh, and it, it's something that seems to be understood by, by many uh, people. One of the things that progressive movements are very poor at is translating uh, their ideas, their values, mm -hmm. into a language that can be widely understood in societies. There's been a kind of a failure, I think. So a failure to think about the challenge of intralingual uh, translation. I think on the other hand, where translation um, powerfully um, combats fear, is that one of the reasons that people fear the other, they fear migrants, they fear people coming into their society, is they don't understand their languages, they don't understand their cultures, they don't understand their values, they don't understand what these people are, are about. And one of the things that the translation does is it, it brings people uh, into the, the world uh, of, these, uh, of, of, of other people. If you think of, for example, um, the history of, of, of colonialism or the history of slavery, um, in many, many uh, territories that were occupied by colonizing uh, powers, um, they treated the, 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 the other person, because they spoke this different language, as if they didn't exist, as if they, you know, they, they were kind of animal-like or, or subhuman. No. Because barbarian. They, yeah, barbarian, yes. because they didn't speak one of the civilized languages. If we think of barbarian, the word mm -hmm. itself, stuttering, it's like the Greeks couldn't understand this, this other language. Um, so therefore, the, um, the road to the humanization uh, of the other um, to the, the ability to identify, to empathize with the other, is through translation. And I think that the most important asset that we need in contemporary society is what I would call um, the uh, empathetic imagination. Um, the uh, ability to imagine uh, what it's like to be someone who is not you, someone who's, who does not speak your language, somebody who's not from your culture, somebody who does not share uh, your values. What is it like to be that person? Um, and this is, of course, uh, one of the most important ways you do that is through uh, translation. So I think translation in an intralingual sense um, has contributed to the formation of fear. I think that translation in an interlingual sense can be a powerful weapon in combating fear. My next question invokes your argument in favor of a politics of microspection. Mm. What features, phenomena, and patterns of translation, in your opinion, are still being blacked out in culture studies? I think that one of the things that's very um, striking for me in, in many of the books that are published in uh, cultural studies is they are, A, overwhelmingly in English, B, um, these books, if you look at their bibliographies, um, almost all of the works that they cite uh, are English language uh, mm -hmm. books. So you have um, these studies of uh, you know, major cities like New York or Chicago or London, or, and what these, um, often these cultural studies books ignore is the sheer uh, immense linguistic diversity of these cities. I mean, as Sherry Simon says, all of these major cities are translation zones. They are alive uh, with, and when you're trying to understand the dynamics of interaction in these cities, unless you take into, a fact, into account the fact of language difference, unless you take into a fact 
uh, the necessity and the demand of translation, you will simply fail to understand the daily lived realities of these metropolitan centres. Um, so I like the idea that um, Stuart Hall has when he talks about vernacular cosmopolitanism. He says, you know, we tend to think of cosmopolitanism as, you know, you go to the great cities like London, Paris, New York, um, and then you, you encounter uh, these great uh, cosmopolitan cultures. And, and he says, no, he says, you go to your corner shop and there's somebody from mainland China who's uh, behind the counter. Um, you go to the dry cleaners and there's somebody who's come from the Indian subcontinent to, um, you're in New Delhi uh, and you've got business uh, men from, and women from 30 different Asian countries working in, in the, 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 the city. So, that, you know, so cosmopolitanism is a daily lived experience for people, not something abstract, not something elite, yeah. yeah. So this is why I mean I argue uh, I've argued in translation identity for the notion of what I call a cosmopolitanism from below, right? Mm -hmm. Not a cosmopolitanism from above, not a kind of elite business class cosmocracy, um, but rather a kind of cosmopolitanism from below, where we use translation to look at those daily minute interactions, different languages, different cultures. Uh, in the, the cities, the towns, even many rural uh, areas in different parts of the world where um, laborers are brought in from different countries to work on the farms. And this, these are the new sites of, of cosmopolitanism. Um, but cultural studies you know, very often ignores uh, the, the translational reality of different places. Well, finally, as many translation scholars are also translator trainers, I would like to ask your opinion about the connection between translation studies and translation training uh, in academia. Let me bring to the forefront the example of indirect translation, mediated translation, or even relay interpreting, which are still today laden with negative connotations, and they, they are not part of uh, translation curricula. Um, in a time when our classrooms are filled with migrants, multilingual subjects, and exchange students, do you think we should still both obliterate and condemn the mediation of other languages in teaching the translation process? No, I think that's a very good question. I, I think there's a, a real problem with what I would call the foundational paradigm of translation training, which was very much driven by two major languages, um, English and French with an imperial past, where the idea was that you know it was axiomatic that you had to translate into your mother uh, tongue, and so um, and you couldn't mm -hmm. uh, translate from your mother tongue into another uh, language, and of course um, that was fine for imperial cultures where um, they had all these people who go, come to the imperial center to learn English or French. Um, but if I think of Estonian, if I think of Latvian, if I think of Lith Lithuanian, um, if I think of you know, how many Portuguese Estonian translators do we have? How many Latvian Irish Gaelic translators do we have? So um, you know, how many um, Polish Finnish translators do we have? So this kind of fixation uh, on kind of mother tongue instruction, uh, I think is, uh, has a very damaging effect in terms, is it, it kind of peripheralizes or excludes um, many, many languages from the possibility of access to, to translation. So I think um, that it's perfectly uh, acceptable. It's, it's a challenge, but I think it's one that's got to be faced. Um, that in many, many languages, people will have to translate out of that language into another language. If Finnish speakers are going to get access to Portuguese, if Lit Lithuanian speakers are going to get access to uh, Irish uh, Gaelic. And that also means that we have to think about the notion of, of relay languages. And um, my, my only concern about relay languages is that I would be worried or concerned uh, that English would become the sole relay language, which means then you get kind of distortion effects. Mm -hmm. Um, that the kind which you're already getting in the scholarship, where the kinds of the forms uh, of uh, the English language, its syntax, the way in which it constructs uh, thoughts and ideas, mm -hmm. um, that these would become hegemonic, um, that they would distort then the, the kind of the translation uh, process. So I think we've got to think about um, translation and training. Again, to go back to the point that I was making at the start of our interview, um, in terms of positionality, in terms of where people uh, are at, 
what their translation market looks like, um, how do they get the, their language out to wider groups of, uh, of people. So how do we make that a reality? How do we make it uh, happen? And I think we've got to adapt our translation methods uh, to that. Thank you so much for being here in Lisbon and for sharing your knowledge with us, Professor. Thank you. It's my, Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you.